Can everybody see my cursor? I hear you. Yeah, should be good. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Michael Weitzner, and um, I'm a dry stone waller who's been uh, in the trade for about 30 years. Um, in 2021, um, there was a uh, notification received by the DCR um, telling them that uh, somebody had seen a collapse in this area over here. I don't know if you can see my cursor. Um, but uh, over here, this area, uh, which is basically the spandrel wall above the arch and uh, the extension of retaining wall that reaches towards the approach, uh, road approach, that had collapsed partly. And uh, so the DCR took the measure of closing the bridge. You probably all know this already, but I'm just recapping so that uh, anybody who doesn't uh, can, can be brought up to speed. So the bridge has been closed since 2021, and um, a, an engineering study was conducted um, in that same year. And last year, um, I was um, asked to do a further uh, inspection of the bridge, um, and we did that. Uh, and uh, here is what we found, pretty much. So. Uh, let's take a look. Um, oh, I need to start my, um, let's see, I, right. So um, I'm going in the wrong direction here. Sorry about that. Okay, here we are. So um, we know that the bridge was built in 1866. Um, and it was one of those wonderful situations uh, in which somebody who wasn't a specialist took on a project that today we would only entrust to a specialist. And um, uh, it's an amazing structure um, given, given that it was built by probably uh, very skilled, but nevertheless amateurs um by the look of it and um it, it's really a, a great example of can do uh attitude and approach to uh, dealing with needs so um how was this bridge built well when one builds a dry stone arch uh, one has to uh, build it on a wooden centering and i'll show you that in a minute um, it's a semi-cylindrical barrel vault, uh, and um, it's supported on each end by vertical-faced abutments, which are basically uh, very strongly built retaining walls. Uh, and those are about six feet high, and then the arch spans uh, above that. So as I mentioned, um, the centering would have been built uh, once the abutments had been completed, and then the arch built over the centering. Um, and uh, once the vault is completed, the vault um, is now self-supporting, hopefully, and you pull away the uh, wooden centering. Uh, and then you build up the uh, spandrel walls to the top uh, where the road crosses and uh, in fill between. So here's what a... Uh, wooden centering or false work looks like uh, when it's in place. Uh, this was in Hillsborough, New Hampshire uh, last century, actually two centuries ago, more or less. <laughs> um, I can't remember the exact date of this, this bridge, uh, but this was the second bridge to be built on this site. Uh, the first one um, was washed out. Uh, one of the problems with um, all dry stone work, and in fact, not just dry stone work, but all masonry work in in uh, rivers like this uh, is that there's potential for the foundations to get scoured out. And um, when that happens, of course, they collapse. So uh, that is what happened here. And then they rebuilt it a little more strongly. Um, and this bridge still stands. So there's some terminology that goes with 
uh, bridges. Uh, the important ones are um, that the arch is composed of voussoir. Uh, plural has an S on it, of course. It's a French word, and um, it basically means vault stone, uh, the voûte being a, a French word for vault. And there are several of these. As you can see here, they're shown as uh, very nicely shaped pieces of stone that are very long. Um, and that isn't typically what you find. They're, they're usually more this sort of shape, actually. And everybody talks about uh, keystone arch bridges. And of course, um, there is a keystone in as much as there's a final stone that goes in place when we build an arched bridge like this. Uh, but it's important to remember that uh, this keystone is doing the same job as its neighbors. It's not a different kind of stone or uh, different in any other way, but for that fact that it was the last one that went in place. And uh, at that point, you, in theory, have a uh, solid arch that will uh, support itself. Um, there are some provisos to that, though and uh, we'll be going into them shortly. So this is the abutment here, and uh, impost simply means the point at which uh, the abutment ends and the arch begins. Um, and often they had this little ledge on them in, in Roman arches, um, which is where this terminology comes from. Um, and this little ledge uh, often was where the centering was set. So they would build the centering and rest it on this little ledge. And uh, when you look underneath the um, uh, New Salem Bridge, you can see that there's a little ledge there just like this, except that it doesn't have, it's not cantilevered out like that. It goes all the way down um, from that, that edge there, the face of the abutment goes down. So it's a dry stone structure. So that means it was built without mortar. And what's holding it together is uh, gravity and friction. And those are the things working against it as well, or rather gravity is. Um, but by shaping the stone appropriately, uh, we can make gravity work in our favor. So um, strong, but uh, not in tension. So uh, stone is a very hard material. Uh, it's not compressible, like perhaps wood would be. Um, there are some stones are harder than others and have more compressive strength, resistance to crushing. Granite is among the hardest and strongest. Uh, so it's a great choice for building, um, building a bridge. And the uh, way that we achieve a stable arch uh, or any, any um, uh, a stable dry stone structure of any kind is uh, by setting up the stones so that they carry the forces through the structure um, all the way down to the bottom in a certain way, a certain strong and safe way. So uh, there's a number of different rules that we follow to do that, uh, including things like putting one stone over two and making sure that any joint um, is, uh, centered on the stones below and the stone below and so on and so forth. So um, the, the net effect is to uh, try to keep all the forces that are acting on the, on, the, on the structure inside the footprint of the structure. So things about arches and vaults, they are strong only when they're stable. That kind of stands to reason, doesn't it? And what does that stability depend on? Well, it depends on the relative sizes of the stones or other components that you're using to build it, uh, what its shape is, and those things determine how the forces are actually transmitted inside the structure. A uh, stone arch bridge couldn't last for centuries and tolerate very heavy loads if it's properly designed and built. Was this bridge well built? Here's a view of the uh, north arch ring. So the arch ring is uh, the outer end of the, the uh, 
vault. The vault is the whole thing. And we call this the arch ring where we see the ends of the stones. Um, and when we look at this, we can see it's not really perfectly semicircular at this point. Uh, it probably started out semicircular, but it isn't anymore. So there's deformation in this vault, and uh, we'll get to more of that shortly. Um, I'm not seeing all of my uh, dots here. My apologies. Okay, I was hoping that you would see some red and yellow dots on this uh, image, but uh, they don't seem to be showing up at the moment. So I can go through this uh, in English instead of in dots. And if you look at these, you'll see that some of these uh, stones are short in this direction. So the radius of the arch, of course, is this, right? Uh, if the center is here, that's its radius. So these stones are arranged radially or should be arranged radially. And they are pretty much in this image, you can see that. But look at how narrow they are from top to bottom here, or from, from inner face to outer face. Uh, a lot of them are really quite narrow. Um, some of them are longer. Um, and some of them, like this one, were placed, they're wedge-shaped, but the fat end of the wedge is on the outer or the, the inner surface of the um, of the vault rather than being up here like this one. Um, so this one has its narrow end here and its wide end here, but this one's the other way around. And there's a number of instances of this. Here's another one. Um, and some of them are just very straight, which is acceptable. Um, and the same is true on the other end of the bridge. Uh, we'll get to it at some point, I guess. Um, in the vault, actually, I want to go back and uh, show you something. I don't know if you can tell from this picture. It's obvious to me because I've seen it uh, in person. But you can see that there's an area in here uh, inside the vault uh, that hangs down a bit lower even than this already lowered section. Um, and that's what we're looking at in this picture. We're looking up at that. And you can see here that there's uh, a series of uh, stones, right? These are the voussoir, looking at them from below. Uh, you can see that there's a running joint here. Uh, what is a running joint? Well, it, it's kind of self-explanatory, but uh, basically it's where you don't have a stone crossing a joint next to it. Um, and this is a really, uh, major deficiency structurally in the in the bridge. And there's a few places where there are smaller, shorter uh, running joints elsewhere in the vault. I just chose this one because it's the most spectacularly uh, egregious one. And you can see here that uh, there's a crack in this stone, which um, is a propagation of that and partly a result of having this, uh, re this running joint here. So we talked about running joints and the crack, um, other things. So here's the collapsing spandrel wall. Um, you can see that this is pretty jumbly in the way it's built. And um, some of these stones are wedge shaped with the fat end of the wedge on the outside of the wall which is okay, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but the wedge is so uh, strongly tapered that stones have actually been squirted out of the wall. This one here is a good example. Uh, this one's going to do the same thing. And it's a fair, uh, it's a fair guess to say that, you know, the, there were others up here that were also um, not very uh, stable stones. And once, things move um, like this and you've got a wedge shape like that, it, it just keeps squirting out slowly. Um, what causes a collapse like this? 
apart from the structural issues that we just talked about. Uh, it could be a number of things. It can be pressure um, on top of the roadway when you have a lot of traffic going across it. Uh, it compresses the material that's behind the wall and that in turn pushes on the wall. So over decades, uh, you can end up with a, uh, a fair degree of movement. And if you couple that with the fact that this wall is only one stone thick, uh, it's not a very thick wall, it's just you know, maybe three feet thick, which for a, a wall that's as tall as this, um, from here to the top of the roadway is um, about 16 feet. Uh, that's that's a relatively uh, narrow wall, and it's backed with loose material. So then we also have uh, the abutments. So here's, I mentioned earlier, uh, the abutment wall runs from here down. So uh, this is the impost right here, and uh, you can't really see it very well in this picture because of the angle at which we're looking, but uh, there's actually a little ledge right on top of that, about four inches deep. Um, so if you look at this, you can see uh, there's a running joint right there. Uh, there's a crack right at the top of the running joint, similar to what we just looked at on the vault. And there are other places where there are weaknesses. So this is a, another weak area here. Um, and here's, for example, a stone that's cracking in many different places. So that was one big stone, but it's full of cracks. And here's a stone that's slipped out or is in the process of slipping out. And if you look at the bottom here, you can see this, the water level is really low in this picture. Uh, you could actually uh, stand ankle deep here, roughly. Um, the stones that are uh, at the bottom on which the entire thing rests are these rounded boulders. Um, and it's, not unusual for things to move easily over rounded surfaces like that. Okay, um, one other deficiency that's worth noting uh, is that here's the, that same abutment we were looking at, but seen from downstream. Uh, here you can see that little ledge that I was talking about at the impost. So this is the first Vusoir, and these stones here are the abutment, uh, parts of the abutment. This was one stone once here, B and B prime, and it has a big crack in it right here. F and F prime were also one stone once, and they've cracked, and, it, and it, it's become two stones. Uh, so what we have here is this area of weakness that's been made worse by this, the cracking here. And that weak area was partly what caused these cracks. Um, this is not well tied back here. Uh, so this entire area is shifting outwards and probably downwards, uh, which in turn has an effect higher up. Here's another example of one of those stones that is wedge shaped um, in the wrong way. And there are a few more on this arch ring too. And of course, we don't know what the back end or the, the hidden end of the voussoirs looks like in the rest of the vault. We, only, we can only see and even guess at uh, what's on the arch rings. Right, so we know that there are some structural deficiencies here, pretty serious ones. What do we really know about its stability and safety? So let's look a little bit, look at that a little bit. Um, so stability in arches and vaults is a result of uh, distributing the weight uh, properly. And that weight results in compressive thrust. So if you have a voussoir that is properly shaped, uh, its own weight and what and the weight of what's bearing on it above uh, will tend to push it down. Uh, but because it's wedge shaped, if it's got the right shape of wedge uh, with a narrow end pointing downwards or into the open space beneath the arch, uh, 
it will not be able to go beyond a certain point. And what happens then is that the weight uh, gets transmitted to the neighboring stones, uh, one on either side. And finally, at the end of the arch where it reaches the abutment, it's pressing down. And of course, there's also an outward thrust. Um, so here's what that kind of looks like in a diagram. So you can see there's a, a line of thrust and we'll, we'll go into that in a bit, uh, but each stone pushes on its neighbor, right? So you've got a, a small element of thrust in this direction and, a, and an element of thrust in this direction for each stone. And cumulatively, they add up to this line here. And this line, you can resolve into horizontal thrust or outward pushing, right? So if you if you were to just stack stones like this without any support out here, um, there's an outward thrust that might end up in this thing moving outwards. And of course, there's the weight of the whole thing bearing down. So an arch is stable if the line of thrust that we just sort of looked at uh, can be contained inside the surface area of the arch. So um, the cross-sectional surface area, right? Um, so this is a cross section, a diagram of a cross section of, a, of an arch similar to the one in New Salem. And these two lines, these two dotted red lines represent the maximum horizontal thrust possible for that configuration to be stable and the smallest amount of horizontal thrust possible. If you venture beyond that in either direction, you can end up with an unstable structure. Okay, so there's stable and then there's stable and safe. Um, and in order for it to be safe, it, it's best if the line of thrust re remains entirely within the central third of the arch ring and uh, all the stones in the arch. Whether it's uh, whether it's a single arch uh, stone thick or whether it's a vault like this bridge, when you have narrower stones, um, you end up with the line of thrust possibly being a little close to the outside. Uh, and in this case, if the line of thrust is close to the inner surface of the arch, uh, you're going to end up with it wanting to burst that way or that way. However, as long as the line of thrust is inside this cross-sectional area, uh, it will not collapse. When would it collapse? So as I mentioned, if the line of thrust exits the um, cross-sectional area of the arch itself, then you can end up with what's called a hinging mechanism. Uh, and as we saw a couple of slides ago, um, or by this slide, there's this outward thrust. And here it's breaking this open. And the result is that this then pops open. So you've got two places where it can open up and then it will collapse here. Sometimes uh, you might have a different scenario where there's a more uneven distribution and just one side pops out and the other pops in. So how can we ensure that we're containing the line of thrust inside the cross-sectional area of the arch? And the answer is make it thick enough. So th the ideal thickness would be uh, for, for the uh, each of these stones to have a length that is equal to somewhere between one fifth on the ideal end and at least one tenth of the span of the entire arch. So if you have a 15 foot, um, uh, 15 foot arch, a span, and uh, you want a very stable structure, you're gonna make these things about three feet, three feet long. And as you can imagine, uh, very few of the stones 
in the New Salem Arch get even close to that. In fact, most of them are about a foot deep. Um, and uh, some of them might be as much as 18 inches deep. What can we do to improve the stability of a thin arch? Well, we can add weight on top, and that's um, that's the best way to manage uh, that stability. If you have just the arch without anything on top of it, it might actually be very unstable. Um, and you know, if you were to walk across an archway, uh, a vault that had nothing on either side of it you could actually cause it to collapse just by putting your weight on a given point, particularly in this area here, which is called the haunch. And it's where those uh, points are that are likely to break out in the, in the uh, as we saw in that earlier diagram. But the bridge is still standing despite all of these deficiencies that we've looked at and the changes that have happened uh, over the last decades. Um, it's important to note that uh, a photo taken in, 90, in 1988, which is the earliest one that we have showing the deformation that we're seeing now, uh, and all the photos taken since 1998, uh, 1988 rather, show a very similar amount of distortion in the vault to what's visible today. So that kind of tells us that, you know, if this thing is not entirely stable, it's not moving very fast at all. Um, and it is entirely possible that it is actually stable in its present configuration. Uh, it also says that the weight of the uh, walls that are above the arch and the infill and the roadway material and how all that weight is distributed might be serving the, the purpose of uh, compensating for this deformation that we're seeing. What can we do to find out more about how stable this thing is? Well, we can attempt to analyze the forces that are at work inside the structure. And we can also look at the structure on a periodic basis, monitor it to see whether there's any movement. And here's a um, what's called a funicular analysis um, of the uh, of the uh, south arch ring. Funicular simply means cable, uh, like a, a cable trolley that runs up and down a hillside. Um, so the way, way we can describe uh, a stable arch, the line of thrust in a stable arch, uh, is to look at the shape of this curve here, this red curve. And if you were to hang a chain or, or a rope, uh, from two to its two ends and just let it hang in the air, uh, two ends separated by, let's say, you know, uh, half of its length or something like that, uh, you would end up with a curve called a catenary. Catenary means chain type curve. Um, and that is what this is. So uh, the strongest configuration, the most stable configuration of forces is the one that um, uh, leads to this catenary curve. Uh, and an arch is just a hanging chain in reverse in terms of how the forces work. Um, and that is, um, that is what the basis of this analysis here. So uh, these little circles represent the centers of gravity of each of the stones. Um, and uh, the dotted line inside here, this blue dotted line with the solid one in the middle represents what is approximately the middle third of these stones. And when you look at uh, the line of thrust, the calculated line of thrust, which is calculated based on these centers of gravity, um, you can see that it doesn't quite fall inside the middle third, but there are many places where it does, just in some places, but in some places it's slightly outside of that middle third. But in almost all of this arch, except for um, uh, this little section down here, 
um, it's inside the cross-sectional area of the arch ring. And we can look at the other arch ring and we get the same, pretty much the same sort of picture there. Uh, this one is a little bit less stable, according to this analysis, than the south arch ring. But nevertheless, the lines of force, line of force is the line of thrust is uh, almost entirely contained inside, except for down here. Um, so this indicates that we have a potentially stable configuration, but it's sort of on the edge. And um, it's an approximation. It doesn't really tell us anything about any of the rest of the structure because we can't see how thick those other stones are. Uh, so all the stones on the part of the vault uh, that we can see from beneath um, when we stand inside the, the uh, barrel of the bridge, we, we can't really see how thick those are. Um, there might be a way to measure that using some amazing x-ray technology or something like that, uh, but uh, it's, it's not something we can do just visually. So um, the degree of deformation is more pronounced in the arch ring, in the uh, north arch ring. It seems likely that it is probably not as stable as the south. We've already talked about that. Uh, there has been some slippage of voussoir and a very pronounced deformation in the vault between the arch rings. I pointed that out earlier, which is also indicative of um, some instability. a yeah, good idea to watch what happens over time with this structure. Um, and uh, if we do see movement over a period of time, we know that that deformation is an ongoing process and it may not be possible to stop it altogether. Um, but until we have a way to measure it, we can just guess. Uh, it's been suggested that we could use a laser scanner, 3D laser scanner, which is a, a wonderful tool. Uh, basically, it, it uh, measures the inner surface of the vault and measures thousands and thousands of points on each, on each, uh, on, on, on the entire surface and uh, builds a map, a 3D map of uh, that structure. And if we were to repeat that process on, let's say, every three months, um, three monthly intervals, um, we could see whether there is any movement uh, because the, the technology is quite precise. And um, what can we do meanwhile? Well, clearly it would be wise to keep the bridge closed um just for safety until we have a a clear picture of what's going on with it all trees and woody growth within 50 uh, 75 feet of the bridge should be removed and any new growth should be prevented um the collapsed southeast spandrel wall can be supported and I don't think it's a good idea to try to rebuild it because that would take too much weight off the existing structure. So best just to shore it up using slope armoring. And we should top up the material that's come off the roadbed uh, so that we have an even load on the, on the bridge. And uh, it would be really helpful to have some informational signage uh, to tell the public what's going on and what they're looking at. So if the bridge is closed, how do people get to the trail system from that end? Well, um, one suggestion is to build a footbridge, which could be temporary or permanent, um, just upstream of the bridge. We could put it downstream as well, but upstream would be a great place to be able to, uh, to, to use it as a platform from which you can see the north side of the bridge, the north face, the north arch ring. And uh, then if the other uh, 
side were made accessible by improving the path that leads to the bank downstream of the bridge, uh, then you'd have both sides visible. If the monitoring tells us that there is no significant movement, uh, it might be possible to reopen the bridge after a little bit further analysis um, to figure out what kind of stabilizing measures might be advisable. However, it could be decided that maybe it's best not to open it again. If there is some movement, then it's clear that the bridge should remain closed. The monitoring could continue until the vault fails, which would be a nice research project for um, somebody who's interested in this area of uh, knowledge. It would be of great value to understand the processes that are involved in the gradual collapse of a stone arch bridge like this one. Can we prevent the vault from collapsing? It might be possible to put wooden centering underneath it and leave it there um, if it's made of the appropriate kind of wood. Um, we could also pour concrete underneath it. Um, so in other words, build an, a concrete arch underneath the existing stone arch. Um, or put a sectional corrugated metal culvert under the arch uh, and fill the space between the stones and the metal culvert panels with concrete. So you'd have to pump it in. And of course, none of those things would uh, be pretty uh, and they would not allow you to see uh, the vault itself. You could see the arch rings, but not the vault. Could the bridge be rebuilt? Well, yes, of course, uh, it could be rebuilt, um, but it would not be a good idea to build in the same way. Uh, it would have to be built with slightly better technique, in fact, considerably better technique. Uh, so it would look different. Uh, we would, you know, you'd work with better stone, uh, better choices of stone. The stone itself, the quality of that stone is fine. Uh, it's the shape of the stones that is not appropriate um, or not entirely appropriate. So while a, a new bridge could be built, it would be a different bridge. Uh, and it would certainly be possible to build a very beautiful new bridge. Um, and it would be better. But it would certainly not be that same bridge that you're seeing now. Um, and the cost to do that would be considerable. Um, looking at about two million or more dollars. So that's a significant amount of money for a bridge that is basically just a pedestrian access. So in summary, um, even if the bridge appears to be stable, it's possible that it's not safe. We really don't have quite enough information to know how long it will stay standing, uh, if it does. And therefore, it's probably a good idea to keep the bridge closed, to monitor its condition and make arrangements to bypass it in order to provide access. And at the same time, provide um, information and a way for the public to see this really wonderful piece of uh, engineering structure. Um, and that's the end of my presentation. I do want to acknowledge uh, that I got the graphics for the physics of arches and vaults uh, from the Auroville Earth Institute in India and uh, the funicular analysis of the south and the uh, north arch rings were carried out by Lara Davis. Okay. I'm going to stop sharing that now and we can proceed to questions. Thank you, Michael. So that was great, really informative. Um, no questions have come in over the Q&A at this point, but if anyone does have a question, feel free to type it in. 
or you can also request to be unmuted and you can ask it over the video. And let me add that there is no such thing as a foolish question. So Mike, we have, um, what kind of stone is the keystone? So the keystone, as I mentioned, um, it's, it's the same exact kind of stone as everything else. Uh, it's all granite or nice. Um, and uh, so granite is a, um, an igneous rock. If that doesn't mean anything to you, then uh, I can explain it briefly. Um, so igneous rocks are the ones that are formed directly from uh, molten magma, molten rock, and they cool and then they set up. And depending on the composition of the magma, uh, they make an igneous rock. Uh, and a metamorphic rock is one that is modified by subsequent heating or pressure or both. Um, and there are different kinds of metamorphic rocks, depending on whether their origins are igneous rock or sedimentary. So you can have, you know, sandstone, for example, uh, getting compressed and uh, turning into mica schist. Uh, you can, it can go further than that and turn into a nice. Uh, nice is spelt G-N-E-I-S-S. It's a German word. Um, so gneiss, if you like. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. and, but gneiss is also formed from igneous rocks. So uh, granite that, is, uh, that has been formed and then subsequently compressed and heated uh, can turn into a nice where uh, there's more clear, uh, you know, uh, there's more more of a bedding pattern to it. So it looks like it's got striations in it when you break it across the, what are supposedly bedding planes. Granite doesn't really have bedding planes, of course, um, but uh, when it's compressed, uh, it, it can change that way uh, according to the direction of the compression. So, uh, to get back to the, the question about the keystone, um, uh, there is no single stone in this arch that we can call the keystone. Um, there's no identifiable single stone that was uh, you know, given a special shape or anything like that. And uh, I don't know which one of them is granite and which one of them is nice because I haven't looked that closely at it. Um, but again, I'll, I'll say that um, a keystone is a, a sort of conceptual thing rather than a real thing. It's, it's our way of saying, okay, we're gonna lock the arch together by putting the last stone in place. But in fact, it does the same job, That's, that keystone does the same job as its neighbors in the arch. They're all working together. Long answer for a short question. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. Um, I think you sort of answered this, but um, the source, of the, the granite in the gneiss? Is it is it local or? Well, uh, we can only guess at that because I don't think there are records. Uh, maybe there are if somebody wants to do the digging, which would actually be really interesting to know. Uh, but typically uh, in situations like this, the stone is quarried as locally as possible. It makes sense if you think about it uh, to source your materials as close to where you're going to use them. Because in the 1860s, uh, you had the choice of teams of oxen or horses and railways, and there was no railway here. So to get your stone onto the site, you're going to use teams. Uh, and that's a lot of work for both the teams and the people uh, running, running them. Often uh, when crews were building walls, there were as many as 20 people working together uh, half of whom were moving stone and the other half were building. So you can imagine that scenario. Um, it's very likely that some of the stone was right there in the riverbed um, or on, on the banks nearby. Um, so Michael, there's a couple other um, just complimentary comments about the presentation, appreciative. Um, someone is asking about how do you calculate the line of thrust, basically? Yeah, um, it's a graphical method that's used typically. Uh, there is a, a way to do it mathematically, 
um, the graphical method is uh, essentially you, you draw um, a series of lines on uh, graph paper and you attach them to each other to get this curve. Um, so you calculate the thrust for each stone and then accumulate them into the uh, into that curve that we saw that red line. Uh, I wish I could explain it a little better than that, but uh, that's it in a nutshell. Um, there are computer programs that can do this too, of course, uh, where you don't have to use a graphical method. It just does it uh, using a, um, a mathematical model. And those, that approach might actually be more precise um, if we can map the stones properly. Uh, that's, that's a key piece to this. I hope that answers the question. Um, there was another question coming in. It was directed to me, but um, maybe you would possibly know, are there any other similar bridges in the Quabbin area that have quote unquote survived and are in use? I have no knowledge of any others, um, but then I'm not very knowledgeable about the area. So um, my guess is that probably not. Otherwise, um, I think uh, Dan Clark uh, and company might have told me something about them by now. Um, I've never thought to ask the question, of course, and um, I don't like to assume that uh, not knowing something means it's not there. <laughs> um, but there are plenty of um, arched, stone arched bridges um, in Massachusetts, throughout New England, in fact. Um, some of them are uh, relatively rudimentary, like this one. Uh, uh, some of them are incredibly polished, and uh, as it won't surprise you to know that the incredibly polished ones uh, are the ones that were on railways and uh, the like, uh, where there was plenty of money available to do the job properly. Um, and the ones that are less polished, uh, obviously, were, were built by small towns um, who had just enough to make it work. Uh, and some of those are the most interesting of them because uh, you can really see uh, the craft at work there. Um, it's, a, it's a different approach to um, the railway masonry, which is very polished and uh, beautiful, but uh, not, as, um, not as interesting in some ways. I think there's one more, let's see here. Um, someone asking, what is the future of the bridge? Yeah, so that's what we're trying to figure out, I guess. Um, and uh, I think the, the, the best way to determine that might be to do this um, monitoring study over a few years, maybe two to five years, um, and see whether there is uh, any movement, any significant amount of movement in the vault. Um, and uh, meanwhile, to uh, shore up that collapsed area. So it's worth pointing out that um, in 1945, there was a similar collapse on the diagonally opposite bank. Um, and uh, so the uh, uh, on the north side of the bridge, uh, across the river from uh, where the currently collapsing spandrel wall is. Uh, that collapsed in, the in 1945, and uh, they didn't rebuild it, but they used the debris from the collapse to um, uh, basically shore up the roadway and, and the bridge. And that was successful. So we could use that same approach on uh, the currently collapsing one. Um, and I'd say that you know even if the uh, even if the bridge is never returned to full access, it's worth holding on to as um, a really interesting piece of the history of the area. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, there was a few people 
asking about that. So uh, Ken has his hand up. Mm -hmm. I think you should be able to unmute yourself. There you go, Ken, you can ask a question. Uh, very good presentation. I was wondering if there are any archival photographs of the builder or builders. So I, I have not um, found anything of that kind, unfortunately. Um, not that I've looked myself, but um, when I when I have asked about it, um, uh, friends of Quabin have uh, a fair bit of information about the bridge, and uh, they don't have uh, anything on the builder other than name and um, where he lived. So he was he was local. Uh, in fact, I think he lived right next to where the bridge is, uh, and so he he was uh, instrumental in. Um, in getting it built because it it was something he needed as much as anybody else did um and uh my understanding is he was a civil war veteran um and obviously a very capable person um his name was adolphus porter we do know that much uh, but there's nothing that i i'm aware of about um in, in the way of uh photographs or um, anything else. And unfortunately, we don't have photos of what the bridge looked like when it was just built, which would be really nice to have. Okay, do we have more questions? I'm sorry, Michael, I was just speaking and I was uh, muted. So nope. someone someone asked, will there be some info posted to educate visitors um, about this project slash process? And I think you sort of already answered that, you know, DCR hasn't made any final decisions yet. And I don't think they've made any, any final decisions about um, interpretive signage up in the area yet, but I imagine there could be in the future. Yeah, and I, my understanding, and, and I could be speaking out of turn here, but uh, Friends of Quabin is anxious to support this effort, um, and uh, they uh, are keen to see something of that nature happen there, and some informational signage, maybe a, maybe even a, uh, uh, a smartphone app or something like that that could work. Um, yeah. Out. <laughs> so Erica or Michael, we've got another one. Uh, why is one end of the arch in worse shape than the other? Is it due to the build itself or due to damage from flooding events? Well, that's a, a very difficult question to answer easily. <laughs> um, in, or glibly, I should say. Um, it could be a number of factors. So it could be the structural deficiencies in the arch. It could be structural deficiencies in the uh, abutments. Uh, it could be that the load um, uh, that acts on the bridge uh, was greater in one area than in another for some bizarre reason. Flooding might have had an effect on the stability of the abutments. That's possible, but there's no clear evidence of scour or damage other than, uh, as I pointed out when we were looking at, um, you know, that abutment wall uh, there on the on that particular side, which was the left bank um, of the um, of the river. Uh, the abutment rests on rounded rocks. Uh, so if there had been stone underneath uh, in the spaces underneath the actual abutment and uh, filling the spaces between the bottom stones of the abutment and those rounded rocks, uh, those might have been plucked out by floodwaters. That is possible. But it's not, you know, without uh, having seen what the structure was like when it was first built without some record of that, uh, it's all guesswork. We, we can only speculate really as to what's happened there.
a comment came in uh, that they like the idea of the addition of a north bridge for walking slash viewing the north side and keeping the access over the bridge closed while the study of movement is established. Um, and then they said, great, great program. Thank you. All right, well, seems like we had a lot of good commentary and questions um, after everything came in and that, that seems to cover everything. Okay, well, if anybody has questions, um, I'd be happy to field them at some point. So, uh, you know, you could collect them and um, uh, maybe send them to me and I'll attempt to answer them. So you could put them on the website, the answers on the website. Definitely, I would say anyone with questions um, about our Keystone Bridge or bridges in, in general, uh, give us a call at the Visitor Center and we'll help you out. All right. All right, thanks again, everyone. I will stop the recording. Well, thank you all. And uh, it's nice to be able to help move things forward here a little bit and uh, give everybody a little bit of a sense of what's going on there. <laughs>